As I'm sure you probably already know, in America there's an election coming up at the end of the year. And much like WrestleMania 40, we're getting a rebatch. Barring an act of God or a, the justice system. This is the best we can do, folks. And I'm sure that you'll hear that America is more divided than at any time since the Civil War. Gaza, corporate taxes, the future of AI, land use rights, Silicon Valley tech bros, immigrants, Dr. Seuss reading drag queens, Title IX. All of these are topics that will be debated over the next couple of months, but perhaps none is a more accurate barometer of the things that divide us than the answer to the following question. Which one of the following two films has a happy ending? <laughs> Regardless of how you feel about politics and movies, all narratives inherently engage in rhetoric. There's always a point of view character, and how that point of view character's journey is treated makes an argument to the audience, whether the writer-director intended to make that argument or not. In fact, sometimes it's better when the writer-director doesn't intend to make an argument because it can reveal a lot of underlying social and psychological baggage. Roman Polanski's 1968 masterpiece Rosemary's Baby remains a horrifying exploration of societal manipulation and the violation of a woman's body. But viewed through a contemporary lens, its protagonist's descent into paranoia and eventual acceptance of a demonic pregnancy feels unsettlingly passive. Enter Immaculate, a film that offers a direct and considerably more aggressive response to Rosemary's Baby. Immaculate utilizes religious horror to deliver a powerful fourth-wave feminist critique of the oppressive nature of patriarchy and the absolute right to body autonomy. This video is pregnant with spoilers, so beware. But if you stick with it, like, comment, and maybe even subscribe. Rosemary's Baby unfolds in a slow, suffocating manner similar to the Ira Levin novel on which it's based. Rosemary Woodhouse, played by a stunningly beautiful Mia Farrow, is the pleasant but somewhat shy wife of struggling actor Guy Woodhouse, played by John Cassavetes. Over the course of the film, she is gradually gaslit by her husband and neighbors, leaving her questioning her sanity and reality. The film's horror lies in her inability to fight back against a conspiracy that targets her very humanity. The story relies on many now familiar tropes that would have the average viewer screaming get the hell out of there at the screen. And even for the time, the ominous story drops create unease from the very beginning. She couldn't have lived by herself, she was 89. Oh. The Woodhouses luck their way into a luxurious New York City apartment at the Bramford, an Italian Renaissance throwback populated by all manner of quirky characters. They got the apartment because the previous tenant, an elderly woman named Gardenia, went insane barricading herself in the apartment before, well, we're never really told. We just know she's slipped into a coma and now the apartment is open. Hey, it's rent control, don't ask too many questions. Well, we'd raise it if we were allowed. The Woodhouses meet Terry, a recovering addict, and her host, the Castavets. The Castavets are nice people, but they have big HOA energy, always in Rosemary's business. Rosemary is a little freaked out by them, but of course, is way too demure to say anything while they're around. And Guy tells her she's being irrational when she brings it up to him. There's always something wrong. And that's really what Rosemary's Baby is all about. The slow undoing of a woman over the course of two hours. As soon as they move in, Rosemary's suspicions are treated as a nuisance, and her desires are waved away like they're the fantasies of a petulant child. And eventually, her physical appearance starts to resemble the tattered person she's become. Terry winds up dead from apparent suicide, and Rosemary is plagued by nightmares, or she can hear the Castavets arguing through the wall, and it seeps into her dream. I told you not to tell her in advance. I told you she wouldn't be open-minded. Rosemary begins to suspect the Castavets are fixating on her, complicating the Woodhouse's efforts to get pregnant. Guy takes matters into his own hands, sort of, by impregnating Rosemary while she's asleep. This is treated fairly casually by Guy, and that would have been par for the course in the 1960s. The marital rape exemption wouldn't be abolished in New York State until the late 1970s. Rosemary is upset, but we're not quite sure if she feels violated by Guy or by the dream she had in which she was impregnated by the devil. Either way, Rosemary's concerns are brushed aside by everyone. Guy, the cast of Ets, the family doctor. They all wave away her anxieties as the hysterics of a high-strung mother-to-be. Rosemary's experiences here tap into the historical concept of female hysteria, the pathologizing of female emotional response for the sake of dismissal and control. Her concerns about her pregnancy are minimized, Anxiety is attributed to nerves, and perceptions of a conspiracy chalked up to paranoia. This dismissal invalidates her experiences and undermines her agency. And the worst part is, Rosemary isn't sure that they're wrong. 
In the infamous and often imitated impregnation scene, Pharaoh belts out, This is no dream, this is really happening! The guy's assurances that it was just good old-fashioned non-consensual baby making cause her to question if it's not just another in a string of vivid dreams. Everyone around her seems to be telling her not to look too far into it. Dr. Saperstein, the doctor the cast of Vets picked out for her, tells her at one point to stop reading books because they fill her head with ideas. I thought you weren't going to read books, Rosemary. It was staring at me in the drugstore. And all it did was worry you. Will you go home and throw it away, please? The film's ambiguity about the conspiracy and Rosemary's breakdown reinforces the idea that women's perceptions are unreliable. This corresponds with the real-world consequences of this trope, making women less likely to seek help or be taken seriously in situations of abuse, gaslighting, or mental health issues. Much of the confusion comes from the Castavet's use of Tannis root to ply Rosemary and keep her foggy. The more out of it she is, the harder it is for her to distinguish reality from fiction and also to stand up for herself. If this doesn't sound like textbook gaslighting to you, then let's check the textbook. In her groundbreaking book on the subject, The Gaslight Effect, psychoanalyst Robin Stern examines the psychological impact of gaslighting on female patients. Stern focuses on how the manipulation, denial, and lying contribute to an erosion of self-esteem and create further dependence on the abuser. But also, what is Rosemary going to do? It's the 1960s. She doesn't have a lot of agency to begin with, and her social vulnerability is compounded by the fact that she's slavishly devoted to her husband's whims. She wants to be the doting wife, and Guy manipulates this by occasionally joking in front of others that she nags him. This causes Rosemary to wonder if she's really being an unreasonable shrew towards Guy and overcompensating by being more docile. This is what Stern and Yale emotional health expert Mark Brackett refer to as the gaslight tango, in which the victim of gaslighting engages in some behaviors that leave themselves open to manipulation. This is why asserting her autonomy becomes so important and why her decision to go from Mod Bob to Pixie Cut becomes so contested. Because it was her decision and hers alone. And that type of independent thinking is threatening to Guy. And this is one of those great moments where fiction and culture collide. And it's why I do what I do. Because Mia Farrow's haircut became symbolic of the second wave feminist movement. Hair is everything. We wish it wasn't, so we can actually think about something else occasionally, but it is. It's the difference between a good day and a bad day. We're meant to think that it's a symbol of power, that it's a symbol of fertility. Some people are exploited for it and it pays your fucking bills. Hair is everything, Anthony. Her hair was already short prior to filming and the blonde bob we see Rosemary with earlier in the film is just a wig. In fact, while Vidal Sassoon gets a name drop in the film, it was Mia Farrow who decided to cut her own hair using a pair of cuticle scissors. And to show just how important and contested women's hair was at the time, not only does it become a point of friction between Guy and Rosemary here, but it triggers this exchange on Pharaoh's TV drama, Peyton Place. You know what it really means, Doctor? It really means I got tired of my long hair. But note that in both cases, a decision about her own goddamn hair became something that she had to justify to a man. It's no coincidence that the only scene in which Rosemary is offered support for her experience comes when the other women at the party lock Guy out of the room and do a quick intervention, telling her to see another doctor. And of course, this act is met with misogynistic dismissal by a panicked Guy. They're a bunch of not very bright bitches who ought to mind their own goddamn bitch. And that's the point. It tells the audience that's asking, why doesn't Rosemary just stand up for herself? that even the slightest assertion of independence will be met with derision and disappointment. That's why, as she starts to research the satanic leanings of the cast of Etz and tell Guy that something is very, very wrong here, audiences at the time felt claustrophobia, and modern audiences feel a sense of frustration. If you say anything more about witches or witchcraft, we're to be forced to take you to a mental hospital. We know what's up with Guy and his recent impossible run of good luck. Donald Baumgart, he's gone blind. He woke up yesterday and he can't see. Oh, I've got the part. You really are the most devious bastard in New York City. Rosemary does eventually get up the gumption to make a break for it and tell Dr. Hill, her own personal physician, giving the audience a momentary sigh of relief. But Hill immediately calls Saperstein and Guy to come get her, thinking that she's just suffering one of those hysterical delusions the females get. And this is where the film critiques the broader societal problem with how people view women. Oh my god, did Rosemary's baby just go woke? Yes, yes it did. The Coven may be the villain of the piece, but the Coven isn't the problem. 
The problem is that average everyday bystanders would rather side with the woman's husband than believe the woman. Even if you think to yourself, well, the woman's story is pretty far-fetched, she does have evidence that everything is not on the up and up with Saperstein and the Castafets. And this is where the film shares more in common with the invasion of the body snatchers than the exorcist. The police, the medical community, the neighbors, none of them will help you. And it's not because they're the bad guys, they just like order. And you represent chaos, lady. Sepperstein sedates Rosemary and induces labor, and of course they tell her that she killed the baby by refusing to go to the hospital and it was stillborn. So it's all her fault. She's such a problem child and now she's killed her own baby. Rosemary hears a baby crying though and sneaks into the parlor where she finds the satanic coven made up of Guy's friends and neighbors celebrating with a new baby. The child not of Guy Woodhouse, but of Satan. What have you done to it? What have you done to its eyes? He has his father's eyes. And the capper is, the coven renames the baby Adrian, after Roman Castavet's satanic father. Rosemary doesn't even get to name her own child. Satan, Satan lives! The year is one! Finally broken, Rosemary rocks the baby in its crib as the coven celebrates. Now, there are a couple of ways to interpret the ending. The most common is that Rosemary's natural maternal instincts kicked in and the overriding drive to be a mother overruled her personal objections about her rape and loss of body autonomy. You're rocking him too fast. In other words, it was all worth it because in the end she chose motherhood. And the destination is more important than the journey. After all, while the child is born of Satan, he's still just a day old and he's innocent. In fact, in the made-for-TV sequel, he shares more in common with Rosemary than he does with Satan. So... This is a happy ending from a certain point of view. He's trying to get me to be his mother. Aren't you his mother? Rosemary chose life and everybody, including the rapey satanic coven, is gonna live happily ever after. I mean, not Christians though. He shall overthrow the mighty and lay waste their temples. The alternate reading of the ending is that it's not at all that Rosemary's baby maker pulled her in the direction of motherhood due to an evolutionary instinct. This was an admission of defeat. She has nothing left. The entire film is her pushing back against the evil goings on at the Bramford, up to and including her own forced pregnancy. And when she thinks she's pregnant with Guy's baby, she assumes that the coven is hoping to sacrifice her child in a blood ritual. They use blood in their rituals, and the blood that has the most power is baby's blood. So every step she takes is in service of saving that baby. I won't have an abortion. And then when she's told she's responsible for the baby's death, she's broken. That's it. There's no Rosemary anymore. A hospital, I might have been able to do something about it, but you wouldn't listen. Her role as Adrian's mom is the only thing that is left. So that's the life she dissipates into at the end. She's been brainwashed and cultivated into motherhood. This isn't maternal instinct, it's survival instinct at best. And that's pretty bleak. But that interpretation requires that you give a shit about Rosemary as a human being in the first place. Promise me you wouldn't be hurt, and you haven't been, really. Regardless though, Rosemary's Baby is a film that has something to say about patriarchal values and consent from, of all people, Roman goddamn Polanski. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that when he made this, he wasn't thinking of the drugging and raping scene as a how-to guide. Maybe he was pulling a Catherine Chamel and saying, I'd have to be pretty stupid to make a movie about drugging and raping a woman, and later drug and rape a 13-year-old. I'd be a prime suspect. And then Michael Douglas has sex with him. Anyway, the point is that the film carries with it a point of view. In his interview with Vice, Polanski focused mostly on the filmmaking aspect and didn't delve all that much into what he was thinking, outside of wanting to make a film that conveyed paranoia. And he certainly did that. The long corridor shots are some of the most memorable, and it's fun to watch with an audience that's never seen the film before, and see them unconsciously lean to one side, trying to get a better look into the next room. But like I said in the opening, sometimes it's better when the point is not intended, because the decisions made in making the film, and the audience's reaction to those decisions, are more telling in the long run. They could have had Rosemary run off with the baby, or kill Guy, or throw herself out the window like Terry, but they didn't. They chose to have the circumstances wear Rosemary down and overwhelm her resistance. 
1968 is that perfect Twilight era when it was unrealistic to consider a woman being resourceful enough to win against this satanic patriarchal system, and too radical to consider taking any other step. I won't have an abortion. The final shot of her rocking the baby is a statement on who still has power and who doesn't. So over half a century later, we get Michael Mohan and Sidney Sweeney's Immaculate, a film that many on social media immediately clocked as a thematic successor to Rosemary's Baby. Immaculate is a passion project for Mohan and Sweeney, who are a longtime director star collaboration team, or at least as long time as you can get, given that Sweeney is only in her mid 20s. Immaculate hits on many of the same story beats as Rosemary's Baby, but it's much more of a modern Blumhouse Atomic Monster style horror film in terms of its tone. There are a lot of evil nun shots and jump scares throughout in place of the slow, creeping dread that permeates Rosemary's Baby. In fact, where Rosemary's Baby lets the audience in on dubious events and danger slowly through the Woodhouse's discoveries, Immaculate Cold opens with the young sister Mary attempting to escape the Our Lady of Sorrow's convent, getting her leg broken through a wrought iron railing, and being buried alive. In correlation, this is Terry's death after the Woodhouse's move into the Bramford. The difference is that the audience sees it happen. So the audience is already ahead of Sweeney's naive Cecilia before she even arrives at the convent. Cecilia believes that she survived a near drowning by the grace of God, so she's looking to serve a higher purpose. Our Lady of Sorrows is at heart a hospice home for elder nuns. The younger sisters are assigned to bathe them, feed them, and make them comfortable on their way to the next life. These are tasks that Cecilia embraces with enthusiasm, despite the spiteful comments of Sister Isabel, who clearly fancies herself Preacher's pet. And I promise you, work is hard, physically and emotionally. So if you're here to find yourself, there are easier ways. I'm not. Sister Gwendolyn, a rebel who likes to sneak a smoke every now and then, offers Cecilia a much easier connection. Maybe a little too easy of a connection for a pair of nuns, if you comprehend my drift. There's always an Eliza Dushku. The film itself doesn't have any sex in it, but that doesn't mean that some of the shots aren't horny as hell. Cecilia meets Father Tedeschi, a good-looking priest who flirts with her in an innocent, ecumenical way. And the way that Mohan shoots the scene where Cecilia kisses his ring as part of her vows is... well... After taking her final vows, Cecilia finds herself pregnant, despite being a virgin. Because Our Lady of Sorrows is also the resting place of the relics of the actual honest-to-goodness crucifixion, they are pretty cool about calling it a miracle and assuming that Cecilia is the new Virgin Mary. Cecilia experiences a sort of hero worship after that, although it doesn't really seem to be a gig she was looking for, and many of her peers get jealous of the attention she receives. In fact, Sister Isabel tries to drown her, claiming it was supposed to be her, before she winds up taking a header off the top of the convent. Add to that the hallucinations Cecilia is experiencing, and you get a harrowing middle act where she's just trying to figure out what the f*** is going on. One thing that is interesting about Cecilia's dreams and hallucinations is that, while they refer back to Rosemary's baby, in this case, they actually are just dreams and hallucinations. There doesn't actually appear to be anything supernatural going on. The priest did, of course, put something in her wine, but they're not responsible for her nightmares. That's pure Cecilia. This is not to say that it's all bread and roses. The pedestal life features perks, but it's also about control. The priests and nuns control every aspect of Cecilia's life, from sleep, to diet, to where and when she goes anywhere in the convent. And this is where the themes of Rosemary's Baby start to seep back in. The horror isn't just about the danger of something lurking in the shadows. It's about the control exerted by a patriarchal bureaucracy. Like Rosemary, Cecilia suspects that there's something wrong and tries to stage her own miscarriage to get out of the convent. That doesn't go as planned, and she's brought back into lockdown with the palpable disdain of the leaders of the convent now coming down on her. In the same way that the coven only cared about Rosemary as a vessel, the church only sees Cecilia as a broodmare. Her worth is in that she's carrying the child and nothing else. If you think that characterization is harsh, the nuns are literally branded like cattle. Cecilia later learns that they've been clocking her since the accident. All of this is pretty standard stuff as far as Catholic-inspired religious horror is concerned, except the church isn't usually shown to be the bad guy, with an arguable exception. What's not standard fare is the church's motives and eventual explanation. And this is the most significant spoiler of the film, and honestly it's the one thing that separates this film from the usual Blumhouse slurry. 
Brace yourselves, because this is where the film tips into Coconut's banana pants territory. Father Tedeschi, whose secular degree is in biology, thinks he can resurrect Jesus using DNA from the blood of the crucifixion. Give me just half a sec. <laughs> what the fuck? And his lab shows that Cecilia isn't the first time he's attempted this. He's got the save fetuses to prove it. It turns out that Cecilia just has the right womb to sustain the awesome power of the Chimerian Carpenter. Maybe it's the blonde hair and blue eyes. Cecilia is able to escape and set fire to the lab. During her Shining-esque escape through the catacombs, Cecilia strangles the Cardinal with her rosary, bludgeons the Mother Superior with a crucifix, and stabs Father Tedeschi through the throat with a nail from the cross of Jesus. It's not subtle! Cecilia is able to escape the convent to a local hillside to give birth to... something. Where she promptly squashes him with a large rock the size of a small rock. This is no partial birth abortion, either. This is a full-on birth abortion. This is the future that liberals want. That's a statement. So, um... What do we do with this? For their parts, both Polanski and Mohan have eschewed any overt political or cultural readings. Both men say that their films were just there to scare the audience, and any polemics are purely coincidental. That may be... But we have one film that predates Roe v. Wade by about five years and ends with a woman capitulating to a satanic cult and opting to raise the demon baby that is supposed to end the world, and another coming two years after Roe v. Wade was terminated in its 196th trimester, in which a woman who was forcibly impregnated with Jurassic Jesus by the Catholic Church opts instead to destroy the child in the ultimate act of defiance. You get how it's hard not to read at least a little politics into this, right? And honestly, it's disingenuous when directors drop these kinds of endings on the audience and then try to play it off like Gwen Stefani being coy about the meaning of Hollaback Girl. You can't just crack open a baby Jesus and then not make an omelet, you know what I'm saying? Moen does spend a lot of time hedging his bets on this one, though. With Cecilia discovering a hidden message in Corinthians about Satan disguising himself as an angel, Cecilia's fingernails falling out in her third trimester, and the baby making gurgling noises when it's born. But all of this does more to muddle the narrative than to explain it. It's like Moen and screenwriter Andrew LaBelle were worried that the audience might turn on the film if it was obvious Cecilia killed a manifestation of her rape, coercion, and incarceration, so they breadcrumbed the narrative with suggestions that it was actually a Satan baby. None of this is supported by anything in the film's final act. There's no big reveal that Tedeschi was a satanic double agent, as implied in the Corinthians verse. The church seems fully cognizant of what Tedeschi was doing, such to the point that someone must have signed off on all this equipment for the last 20 years. It's taken us 20 years of trial and error. Thematically, a Satan baby just wouldn't make sense in Immaculate. But there are enough illusions to give the audience some vague recollection days after they watch the movie that this was Cecilia killing a demon, and that makes it okay. At the very least, though, if the creators are going to death of the author themselves, we can at least see these films as cultural time capsules. Michael Moen says he just wanted to make a scary movie, and, like, okay, but he still had to make choices about what is scary to lift it above the typical jump scare porn. And what is most recognizably scary to audiences in 2024 is the loss of body autonomy. Tonight, the Indiana doctor who performed an abortion on a 10-year-old rape victim taking extra security measures as she prepares to take legal action. And instinctively, Mohan knows what he's doing. At no point does Cecilia show any indication she's happy about carrying the savior baby. In fact, she seems to think that this whole situation sucks, but it's her burden to bear. Cecilia is concerned for the baby, but she's also, first and foremost, concerned for Cecilia. This is not the case for Rosemary, who was a little hurt in the way that she was impregnated, but because she's never quite sure what the reality is, and she doesn't even comprehend the meaning of having control over her own body, she constantly returns to playing the role that Guy wants for her. Until the haircut. In both cases, the women, who are the main characters of their respective films, are persona non pertene. They don't matter. Or they only matter in as much as they are necessary to carry the children, because the men of the story can do it, and the women who are aiding the men are too old. And that's where the relevance of the comparison comes in. Rosemary Woodhouse lives in a burgeoning second-wave feminist world, and Cecilia lives in a fourth-wave feminist world. The difference being that women had gotten a brief taste of economic and social freedom during World War II, and many of them felt locked out of the post-war America economic and cultural boom. So they took to the streets and college campuses in pursuit of being let into institutions 
that were almost exclusively male. In fact, most of the 1980s and early 1990s were about breaking down the walls that kept women out of corporate boardrooms, police stations, military academies, and the tech industry. On the other side, the fourth wave feminist movement, which had been simmering on the internet for a while, bubbled over in January 2017. And you're more likely to find fourth wave feminists who are focused on burning the whole goddamn thing to the ground rather than be part of it. It's less about getting on the board of Miramax so that you can have input on decisions and more about digging out the rotten decay and playing high lie with Harvey Weinstein's nutsack. If you have a generation raced entirely online, you're not gonna eliminate a social movement, you're just gonna have a social movement marinated in online culture. That's what makes this a shot across the bow at Rosemary's Baby, whether Moan intended that or not. Cecilia ain't waiting around to find out if her maternal instincts will kick in. Cecilia makes what is a radical, but understandable given her circumstances, decision to dash the baby with a rock. But regardless of how each woman handles the forced pregnancy situation, one thing that is becoming more apparent with each passing generation is the systemic nature of the problem. The coven operates brazenly, and Tedeschi has the full faith and credit of the church behind him. The problem is not as small as simply sending the cast of Vets to jail, or running away from Guy Woodhouse, or even killing Father Tedeschi. Like a hydra, the system will simply regrow and move on. If you die, we'll find another. And that means neither of these films can have a happy ending. In the end, both women were subject to forced impregnation and held captive like gestation pets. Regardless of their respective decisions, they still have to live in a world that allowed that. Elf <laughs> 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 <laughs>